Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about a critical technology for spaceflight, solar cells. Now, I've previously covered nuclear and fuel cells for powering spacecraft, but uh, solar is by far the most common power source in spaceflight. You probably know that solar panels work by absorbing sunlight and converting that to electricity. And they were first used on one of the oldest satellites, the oldest satellite still in orbit, Vanguard 1, which used solar cells on its surface to charge the battery that powered the transmitter. The concept of the, photo, the solar panel, or photovoltaic panel, was pioneered by Bell Labs. They were originally interested in powering remote telecommunications equipment, and satellites just happened to fall into that category. But the origins of the solar you know, photovoltaic cell date to the 19th century with someone called Charles Fritz who installed solar panels using selenium with a thin layer of gold. He, he, these were on a rooftop in New York in 1884 and at the time nobody actually understood exactly how they produced electricity. It would take Einstein's Nobel Prize winning work on the photoelectric effect to give scientists the framework to understand what was going on. But even then, the efficiencies of the panels they had were only about 1% and little progress was made until Bell developed semiconductor solar cells using silicon in 1954. Those solar cells managed efficiencies of about 5% and over the last 60 years or so, technology has pushed the limits higher and higher. The cells used in modern spacecraft are now like triple junction gallium cells with 30 to 40% efficiency. And some researchers are getting close to 50% efficiency using six layer cells. So how do solar cells work? Well, solar cells are semiconductor devices, which are of course the basis for all modern electronics. Silicon-based semiconductors start with crystalline silicon, which is electrically insulating, it's not conductive. And then you add small amounts of other elements like phosphorus or arsenic or boron in a process called doping, and that changes the electrical properties. And by you basically mashing these things together, you create junctions between different silicon doped in different ways. You can create things like diodes and transistors and other components. And if you throw enough of these together into one place, you get a computer and you have managed to make rocks think. So solar cells are essentially diodes where you've got positive and negatively doped semiconductors bonded together, making uh, an electrical barrier which stops current from flowing in one direction. It can flow in the other, but not in, in one direction. So then in a solar panel, energetic photons come in and they hit uh, electrons are minding their own business and knock them over this barrier. And then they flow around the circuit. And in the process, you can harness the energy of them flowing around. And now you are powering your spacecraft. Obviously, this is a very rough outline. You know, if you want to get into the weeds about, you know, silicon doping and electron diffusion and all this other stuff, then yeah, there's physics degrees for you. So the photons have to have enough energy to knock the electrons free and then into this gap. And, well, and this is called, uh, this amount of energy is called the band gap. So the energy is measured in electron volts because they're talking about very small amounts of energy for a single electron. And it's about 1.16 volts or electron volts for silicon. So if a photon has at least this amount of energy, it can drive the electrons over the potential barrier. The more photons arrive, the faster this happens, the more current you get, and the more energy you get as a result. Now the voltage in the circuit attached to this is only about 0.6 volts. So if you want to get useful voltages, you also need hardware to up, you know, raise up this voltage. 1.16 electron volts is equivalent to a photon with a wavelength of about 1100 nanometers. So all visible photons have enough energy to drive a silicon-based solar panel. However, the excess energy above the band gap energy is lost and converted to heat. So if you have a broad spectrum light source like the sun, there's a trade-off to be made in choosing a band gap. The smaller the gap, the more photons you can use, but the less energy you get per photon. And calculating the ideal band gap was done by William Shockley and Hans Joachim Kaiser, or Kaiser um, in the 1960s. And for 
Our sun, with a surface temperature of about 5800 Kelvin, the ideal solar cell should have a band gap of about 1.36 electron volts, and silicon has been close enough and well understood enough to be the material of choice. So the same calculation also derived the theoretical limits on the efficiency of solar cells. This is known as the Shockley-Kaiser limit. Now, for silicon, this is about 32%, but the best that has been achieved is about 27%. And the you know, commercial, commercial crystalline you know, solar cells are more like 24% efficient. One reason for this is that you, in a real solar cell, you, know, you need to have things like wires and electrodes running across the panel, and that stops some of the light and ruins your efficiency. But anyway, this is a limit that can actually be exceeded because that's a limit for a single junction. And if you stack multiple junctions with different band gaps covering different photon energies, or therefore different colors of light, you can have it so that the high energy photons get hit on the first layer and they get filtered out. The next layer down absorbs a, you know, lower energies and maybe a final layer absorbs even lower energy still. And for example, a common design uses indium gallium phosphate, which is band gap of 1.86 electron volts, and that absorbs visible photons down to about 700 nanometers. The next layer is indium gallium arsenide, and that has a 1.2 electron volt band gap, and that covers photons down to about 1100 nanometers. Finally, a germanium layer with 0.65 electron volt band gap, and that covers photons down to 1900 nanometers. So these triple junction cells are getting close to 50% efficiency, and because they're so much more efficient, spacecraft are all using multi-junction solar cells due to the reduced mass requirements for the same power output. Now, when you're designing a spacecraft to use solar cells, there's some other important considerations to be made. First, the efficiency of solar cells is affected by the temperature of the panels. As they heat up, the thermal energy means that the atoms are bouncing around more, so the bound electrons that you're trying to knock off actually have a bit more energy Therefore, it takes less energy to kick them off, but that also means your band gap has shrunk, and so you actually get less voltage out of the panel, and therefore less power gets harvested. And this becomes important in spacecraft where they're moving closer to the sun. Like, you might think that, uh, you know, just getting closer to the sun via the inverse square law means you're getting much more energy. But because the panels are getting hotter, you're losing a lot of those gains, and so it's not quite as simple. And an extreme case is the Parker Solar Probe, where they actually have to have a cooling system on the panels, and then they place the panels at a very low angle to stop the panels overheating and potentially getting damaged when they're passing close to the sun. Solar panels also tend to degrade as they're used over time. They, you know, they lose efficiency. And there's a variety of reasons for this, like the, the thermal cycling from the day to night uh, transitions that stresses connectivity you know, in the panels, like high energy photons or ionizing radiation or even protons from the radiation belt, they can degrade the crystalline structure of the semiconductors at the atomic level. And you know, near the Earth, monoatomic oxygen in the tenuous, you know, expanded atmosphere can react with the panels and damage them in that way. Now, some of these can be minimized with things like coatings that repel ultraviolet and seal the semiconductors away from contaminants, but solar panel degradation still happens and it needs to be built into mission plans. Now, at the other end of the scale from Parker Solar Probe, we have missions to Jupiter, which use huge solar panels to make up for the fact that the sunlight is so much lower intensity. Like at the Earth, we get about 1400 watts per square meter. At Jupiter, we only get about 50. When Galileo was launched to Jupiter in 1989, it had to use a radioisotope thermoelectric generator powered by, by plutonium-235. But the cost of that has risen, and to make enough plutonium to power Juno would have cost $200 million. Uh, Juno's three solar panels are like 9 metres long, 2.7 metres wide, and they generate only about 450 watts of power, some of which has to be used to heat, keep the spacecraft warm. In the end, the panels were a couple of hundred kilos heavier than an equivalent RTG, but this is a rare case where the hardware cost was the deciding factor over the mass and therefore the cost to launch that mass.
There are limits to how far out you can use solar panels. At a certain point, the photon flux will get so low that it actually the voltage just precipitously drops off. So you can't generate any power. Like there is light coming that's just not enough to sustain a current that can generate any power. One way to fix this is to have a small solar panel with large solar concentrator optics to focus the light on the panel. Like, and a reflective panel, by the way, is a lot cheaper than a solar cell, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there are actually small test cells on the DART mission doing exactly this. Now, if you are using an optical focuser or concentrator, they do need to be kept actively aligned with the sun because they're focusing at a point. If they go out of alignment, then you know your image of the sun goes out of alignment. But yeah, missions that operate in low Earth orbit, they actually have benefited a lot from commercial solar power developments on Earth. But panels out on the edge of the solar system, you know, low intensity, low temperature environments, they haven't really benefited because there's no use for it on Earth. NASA thinks that it can probably make solar powered missions to Saturn work. But beyond that, they still think that, uh, you know, Neptune and Uranus very much a nuclear only zone. Finally, designers of space missions also have to consider the design of the panels that carry the cells. In the case of Vanguard, they were just placed all over the surface because the spacecraft had no attitude control. Spacecraft still use surface-mounted solar cells today, but uh, you know, it removes a possible failure mode not having to deploy panels. They're very common on CubeSats, and even large spacecraft like Dragon and Starliner use arrays of fixed solar cells attached to the structure. Now, the first spacecraft that moved the cells off the surface and onto panels outside the spacecraft was probably Explorer 6, which had four paddles, that's what they called them, with solar cells that unfolded. You know, these just increased the surface area available. The spacecraft couldn't align them, it was spin stabilized, and it couldn't point them at the sun. Mariner 2, I think, is the first interplanetary mission with solar panels, and that had three axis stabilization, so it could actually point the panels at the sun by rotating the spacecraft. Fixed panels are probably the most common design that you see in spacecraft, but they can put constraints on spacecraft operations, forcing the spacecraft into attitudes that are required for power management. Some spacecraft get to use movable panels, which can orient to maximize solar panels, uh, solar power, while allowing the body of the spacecraft to point in a different direction. For example, you know, if you want to point sensors at one target, uh, while the panels continue to point at the sun. And I think the first spacecraft to do this was Nimbus 1, which was a second generation weather satellite launched in 1964. Usually this is only a single axis of rotation, but uh, in the case of the International Space Station, it actually has two axis orientation because the space station is supposed to keep a fixed orientation reference to its orbit and still needs to track the sun in two axes. Then there's also the problem of folding a large set of panels down to in, into the smallest space possible so it can fit inside a, a you know, fairing on a rocket. That's a whole different set of engineering challenges and you can see various solutions on various spacecraft over the years. There's the classic you know, folded stack of sheets pattern, and then there's the design that was seen on the International Space Station where they had like guide rails that deployed and cables that pulled out the very densely folded patterns. You have spacecraft like Lucy and Cygnus, which use panels that are folded like a fan and they unfold into a circular shape. And uh, many designs are using like, uh, they use rolled up panels. Now on the rolled up panels, the material they're on can be flexible, but the cells might still be fixed, you know, non-flexible cells. They're just curved at a rate which is sufficiently low that you can use fixed tiles. So this is the kind that was used on the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. Solar cells are usually just one part of a spacecraft's power system, with batteries needed to store power for the time spent in the dark. Usually spacecraft are designed so that the electronics operate directly off the battery, and the solar pan power system is only there to charge the battery. But in the case of the satellite AMSAT Oscar 7, which was an amateur radio satellite launched in 1974, the satellite died with a battery failure in 1981. But in 2002, 
21 years later after its death, it began transmitting again, but only when in sunlight. And the theory is that the continual, you know, uh, power coming in from the batteries tried to drive current into the battery and it eventually short circuited the battery and allowed the panels to directly power the spacecraft. And amateurs are still detecting the spacecraft's transponder today. And it's very likely the oldest satellite in space that's still operational. And it's able to do this because after almost 50 years, it's still powered by the sun. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.